Welcome to Haddonfield United Methodist Church on this beautiful summer Sunday morning. Wait, has it, no, my son will tell me. It's not summer until what, June 20 something? 21st, 22nd? So it's just a normal Sunday, so never mind, not the summer part. (laughs) It is Father's Day. Happy Father's Day to all those fathers celebrating today. Let's stand together and sing in our worship service. We're going to start with Firm Foundation. Let's stand together and sing.
Good morning, everyone. It's uh, wonderful to be here today on this beautiful Sunday, and I do wish a very happy Father's Day to all the fathers and fathering spirits and those who celebrate today. Um, I'm grateful to be here in the room with all of you and also grateful to have folks worshiping with us online from wherever you may be. Um, as always, we have our announcements in the bulletin for those of you here, and also we have them online at HaddonfieldUMC.org slash now. If you ever uh, scan the QR code behind those chairs, it will take you to that page, which is just uh, the announcements and links to videos that we're doing and our worship series as well. Um, I'm just going to run through a few real brief announcements today. Um, on page nine, you'll see that uh, at the very bottom it says, Essence of Harmony Choral Society Concert. Today we're hosting a choir who are going to give a gospel choir concert uh, in honor of Juneteenth. And that's today at 3.30 in our sanctuary. There's a $15 uh, ticket cost at the door, but all are welcome and there will be more than enough room. So I invite you, if after you've already gone out to lunch for Father's Day, if uh, you have some time to come and celebrate and to, to listen to the witness of the Juneteenth story in gospel music. Um, we are also continuing to look for VBS volunteers. We need about 20, um, and we especially need teachers. So if you feel that you have any ability whatsoever to be in a classroom uh, with others, please know that, that it's not nice to have. It's actually really necessary right now. We're looking for 20 teachers. So there's information in our bulletin about how to sign up and let us know about um, if you would like to volunteer for Bible school, and that's in page 10. Um, we are also looking for supplies for VBS. If you're not able to volunteer, or even if you are, but you would like to uh, donate supplies, you can find information also on page 10 for our Vacation Bible School donation list. And as always, we have that on Amazon, as well as a physical list as well. We're looking for a few Sunday school volunteers through the summer. We have a one-room Sunday school uh, schoolhouse that where all the classes are together, and we need a couple more volunteers to make that go. So if you would like to volunteer, we would appreciate that. And, uh, and that's it, right? Today, I just want to say that uh, Father's Day marks the end of our program year. Uh, the program year is kind of like a school year at the church, and that's when we, we structure all of our programs. This is spontaneous. It's not in a script. But I just want to hear from you. What is one thing from September till now, what's the one thing you're just really grateful for? Maybe you just never thought it was possible as we came out of COVID, whatever. Online worship, connect groups. Tom? Amen. We're grateful for her too. Thank you. Good health. Yeah, your sister's in California for college stuff. Anything else we're grateful for in this program year? Kids group. We have amazing kids here. Music. This service, let's say thanks to God. Let's just offer a prayer and we'll continue to worship in song. God, we thank you for this year in which some things we thought would not be possible have been possible. Things we couldn't imagine uh, are, are reality and people we didn't know are now friends. God, bless this church. Bless each person here. Bless our families. Bless our fathers. Bless our children. Bless all of the people who are part of this community. As we worship you today, oh God, strengthen our spirit. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. I invite you to stand as you would. Let's sing to God. It's a fitting song to sing. This is called Promises. And it just talks about no matter what, what goes on in our lives, what storms may pass or come, that God's always there with his love. Let's sing together. time again you have proven you do just what you say though the storms may
sing a song. It's called Broken into Beautiful. And Miss Pat's going to lead us in this. Lord, your restoring the ancient ruins you are rebuilding a holy nation for your great name. Sing with us. Lord, you will rescue the lost and fallen. You are redeemed. Good morning, everyone. It is so good to be back from my vacation and good to see you and worship with you, our good God, who is faithful and who loves us always. This day, we give thanks to God for our fathers, our own fathers and father figures who are fathering spirit, who have poured out their love and who helped us who we are today. But also, we acknowledge this day could be very challenging and tough for many of us if whether we lost it, our fathers and or uh, we couldn't have any uh, good chances to build good relationships with our fathers so either way we want to come to God right? lift up our broken relationships or lift up our gratitude and thanksgiving because God knows who we are and our heart before we say a word. And so I invite you to take a deep breath this moment. Silence all the voices in your head, but come to God and seek God's presence among us. Take a deep breath, breathe in. 
and breathe out. Breathe in and breathe out. Please join your heart with mine in prayer. O oh God of love and compassion, we thank you for a gift of life, a gift of breath we take, a gift of freedom we enjoy, a gift of the community. We share our journey with each other, week in and out, and a gift of people who help us to experience what love looks like, what peace feels like, what joy sounds like. On this day, we remember and thanks to you for our own fathers and father figures in our life who have poured out their love on us, helped us to be who we are today, whether they are near or far or in heaven. Oh Lord, remember your beloved children who do feel challenges this day and help us pour out our love into the next generations in our family, community, and society in whatever forms available for us, like many others who planted the seed of love in us, ahead of us. Oh Lord, most of all, we thank you, our Heavenly Father. Oh Lord, thank you for your love, your peace and compassion. You pour out your love even before we are aware of it. And we are here to worship and lift up our praise and thanksgiving together. Oh Lord, receive us. Receive our prayers and worship. On, as we celebrate Juneteenth, we offer a prayer of thanksgiving and praise for your hearing the cries of the oppressed. Bless your name for giving us victory and freedom over slavery on this land. Breathe into us your eternal breath that we may never tire of ensuring a flourishing of life for all people. But most especially those, remember those, our brothers and sisters whose growth had been suppressed by the trauma of being enslaved this day. O oh Lord, continue to show us your goodness that we may have the strength to advance your kingdom with humility and grace. We may not fully understand your divine nature, but we catch a glimpse of the depth of your love as we experience your embrace and forgiveness day, and day by day. Thank you for being the same God who has been faithful yesterday, today, and tomorrow. Thanks for being the same God a way maker and miracle worker. Listen to our prayers of a heart with deep pain and hurts and bring your healing and wholeness and be active in our lives. We pray for your children who are suffering from their health concerns. We pray for those who are in grief from their loved ones, the loss of the loved ones. We pray for the victims of the violence and natural disasters and their families. Oh Lord, have mercy on us and hear our prayers. We pray all these, our spoken and unspoken prayers of heart. In the name of Jesus, our Christ, who loves us more than we can imagine, the Prince of Peace. And we continue to pray together with the word that Jesus taught us how to pray long ago. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power glory forever. Amen.
Good morning. The word of God for us today is in Matthew 7, verses 1 through 12 and 24 through 27. Do not judge so you may not be judged, for the judgment you make will be, the, will be, you will be judged, and the measure you give will be the measure you get. Why do you see the speck in your neighbor's eye, but do not notice the log in your own eye? Or how can you say to your neighbor, let me take the speck out of your eye while the log is in your own eye? You hypocrite, first take the log out of your own eye, and then you will see clearly to take the speck out of your neighbor's eye. Do not give what is holy to dogs, and do not throw your pearls before swine, or they will uh, trample them underfoot and turn and maul you. Ask, it will be given to you. Search, you will find, and you will find it. Knock, and the door will be opened. For everyone who asks, receives, and everyone who searches finds, and for everyone uh, who knocks, the door will be opened. Is there anyone among you, if your child asks for bread, will you give a stone? Or if a child asks for a fish, will you give a snake? If then you, who are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven give good things to those who ask him? And everything uh, do others uh, to you as you would have them do to you. And for this is the law of the prophets. Everyone who then hears these words of mine, acts and on them will be like a wise man who built his house on rock. The rain fell, the floods came, and the winds blew and beat on that house. But it did not fall because it, had found, it was founded on rock. Everyone who hears these words of mine and does not act on them will be like a foolish man who built his hand, house on sand. The rain fell, the rain fell, the floods came, and the winds blew and beat against that house, and it fell, and a great fall it was. This is the word of God for the people of God. Lord, make me an instrument of your peace. Where there is hatred, let me sow love. Where there is injury, pardon. Where there is doubt, faith. Where there is despair, hope. Where there is darkness, light. Where there is sadness, joy. This makes for a beautiful prayer, but have you read the comments lately? In a world of loud opinions, deep divides, and growing animosity, how can we ever be peacemakers in today's world? Come find out this June, the practices of peacemaking. Ask anything, listen well, disagree freely, and love regardless. Friends, I encourage you to turn to page 7 in your bulletin, if you would. Uh, we have sermon notes prepared for you to take some notes down. Uh, I'm going to cover, actually, a lot of material today, so you may want to um, use that, that guide for you. And then it, uh, for folks worshiping with us online, again, that uh, now page, haddonfieldumc.org slash now, you'll find our sermon notes in the bulletin there as well. Will you join me with a word of prayer, and then we'll look at peacemaking. Loving and gracious God, we are grateful for your spirit upon us today. Strengthen this, your preacher. And God, may we decrease less of us and more of you. God, may we make room for your spirit to move, breathe, and speak. In the name of the risen Christ, we pray. Amen. So what is your creed that you live by? Do you think you could summarize in a mantra, you know, what guides your principles and how you make decisions, how you live your life, work hard, play hard, do good? Well, I recently encountered a poster in a frame in this church building that spoke to me. And the poster says, love and tolerance. Does anyone know where I would have encountered that poster in this building? In the scout room. And it's a place where we have 12-step uh, recovery groups. I think there are about seven or eight meetings in that room alone each week. And it actually comes uh, from a segment of the uh, Alcoholics Anonymous big book that says, Love and Tolerance is Our Creed. Think about that. Love and tolerance is our creed. So whether you know what is or isn't your own creed, today what I'm really interested in exploring is how different would the world be if every Christian lived as though 
love, and tolerance were our creed. Can you imagine that? Well, let's think first and foremost the context in which that exists. So, so a recovery group where the primary purpose for people who are coming into that fellowship are seeking recovery from hopelessness that comes from addiction. So in that context, love and tolerance is not a nice thing, right? If I say it in church, it's like, oh, that's nice, or it's wishy-washy, right? But if you are coming to a place, if you're in that room, you've seen some stuff. You have needed love and tolerance in your life. And if you are going to stay in that room, you need the space to deal with your stuff. And so there's really a sense that when love and tolerance is our creed, it's because we have needed love and compassion and tolerance from other people, and therefore we offer it to one another. And I would make the case that in that context, love and tolerance is not something nice. It actually is the difference between life and death. Because if your life is an absolute mess and you believe that people accept you just as you are so that you can reclaim hope and reclaim sobriety in your life, you may stay. But if you do not feel welcomed, you are not going to stay and you may lose the battle to hopelessness. Are you all with me? I think about how that applies for the rest of us. How many of us need love and tolerance to get through this thing called life, and yet when we don't experience it, it only causes us to plunge deeper into isolation, loneliness, helplessness, and all the things we face. As much as we love, we would like to say that love and tolerance is indeed our creed, or we would, could claim that for ourselves. You know, and I know, that we are living in a moment in, in time in which that is not the dominant thought in society. Love and tolerance do not pervade in our social, political, and business behaviors in the world today. Instead, wherever we go, it seems that we are facing anger, hatred, contempt, frustration, mistrust, polarization, and intolerance at all men, almost every factor of our life. We see it on the news, we see it online, we see it on TV, we see it at work, we experience it in our own families, and yes, it exists in the Christian church. And that's why over the last three weeks, we have been preaching on the practices of peacemaking. Because more than just something that's nice to do, Jesus actually said to his disciples, blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. And so it begs the question, well, then how do you make peace? And so I've been introducing these four practices that were developed by National Community uh, Church in Washington, D.C. It was actually uh, devised by their youth ministry, their senior high group. And uh, just a recap of those four practices. They are ask anything, listen well, disagree freely, and love regardless. And today, as we look at love and tolerance as our creed, I want to take on perhaps the tougher one on this list, which is disagree freely. We have the first half of that down pretty well, right? It's the second half that's not as easy. Well, I want to start with the passage that was read by uh, Brad today, Matthew 7. Um, in that passage, at the very end, Jesus tells a story that maybe you are familiar with. Jesus says there's a, there's a man who builds a house on a rock, and when he builds the house on the rock, the storms come, the waves rise, and the winds blow, and what happens to the house? It stands, right? It survives. And then Jesus says there's someone who built their house on sand. They did not build their house on a rock, and the winds come, and the storms rage, and the winds blow, and it does not survive, right? So what's that story about? I, know, I can tell you what I was taught as a kid in Sunday school. That what it means is, if you believe in Jesus and you trust Jesus, when the storms of life blow, you will have a foundation and God will get you through those times. And I just want to say that's a beautiful message. It is not an untrue message. It just is, it is not as what Jesus says. It's actually not what he says in the gospel. So today I actually want to look at, did any of you learn that that's what that story means? Trust Jesus and you will get through the storms of life. Anyone else go to Sunday school with me? Okay. Well, Jesus actually says something a tiny little bit different. Again, that's not an untrue interpretation. 
It just is not exactly what he said. So let's back up. In, in chapter 7, Jesus, I'm going to summarize some points of what Jesus says in that chapter that Brad read. Number one, Jesus says, do not judge so that you will not be judged. But if you do judge, however you judge someone, you will be judged. Then the second thing he says is, don't be a hypocrite. Don't focus on the faults of someone else as though you don't have any faults yourself. Then he says, don't, don't give your pearls to swine. Don't take holy things and mire them up in the muck of conflict and of debate. And then Jesus says, seek God's kingdom, seek, ask, and search, and whatever you seek from God, God will give you. And then Jesus introduces what we call the golden rule, which is do unto others as you would have them do unto you. And then Jesus says, after don't judge, don't be a hypocrite, don't throw your pearls to swine, seek what God wants, do unto others as you have them do unto you. Then Jesus says, everyone who hears these words of mine and acts on them will be like a man who built his house on a rock. So what's the story about? Is the story about believing or is it about doing? It's about doing. It's about hearing and doing. Jesus constantly in the Gospel of Matthew says, you are my follower if you hear my commandments and practice them. You are my friends if you do what I say. So this passage is about simply what is Jesus saying that we will build our house on a firm foundation if we what? If we don't judge, if we're not a hypocrite, if we don't focus on the faults and the failures of other people, if we do not obsess over who is wrong, if we do unto others, right? I, I want to call out my oldest daughter, who Annalise, who watched a late night uh, interview of a musician with me recently. I think it was Jimmy Fallon. And uh, Jimmy Fallon asked the, the artist, how... How would you account for your success at a young age? And she said this. Well, I live my life by the golden rule. Do unto others as they do unto you. And what did my daughter say? That's not the golden rule, right? It's, that's not it. The, Jimmy Fallon didn't call her out. He didn't correct her. I bet most of America thought, oh, that's a good rule, right? Do unto others. Jesus points to something that is unconditional and not conditional. Most of the Gospel of Matthew is, is Jesus teaching us how to live in God's reign. God's kingdom, in which we all live in, is bigger than human laws. It's bigger than human politics. It's bigger than human desires and material stuff. And in God's reign, the, a primary attribute is peace. God is a God of peace. And what do we call Jesus, especially at Advent time? Jesus is the prince of of peace. But God's peace is a little different than the world's police, uh, peace. Pardon me. There's a word in Hebrew that we translate as peace, and that word is shalom. Now, shalom doesn't just mean the absence of violence or the absence of conflict. Shalom means the presence of wholeness. Shalom means it's not a vacuum. It's actually the presence of thriving healthy relationships, people caring for one another. It's a place in which you thrive and I thrive, mutual healing and happiness. And so Jesus, when he tells his disciples to be peacemakers, he's teaching them that God's peace is different than the, than the world's peace. And so therefore, God's peacemakers make peace different than the world makes peace. Now, there are two primary ways I think that the world seeks to make peace, and they were definitely prevalent in Jesus' days. Do you know what they are? Number one, beat your enemy. And number two, make everyone like us, right? Wouldn't the world just be a lot better if everyone thought the way I did? And let me tell you all the ways in which you can start now. Well, number one, in Jesus' day, beat your enemy is how Israel constantly tried to make peace in the Old Testament, and it worked out until it didn't, right? They beat the Amorites and the Jebusites and the Moabites until they met their match in the Babylonians. The problem with beating your enemy for peace is that eventually there will be an enemy who is bigger, badder, tougher, 
fiercer, more violent, and more reckless than you. And then the peace is at your expense, right? The Babylonians were at peace when, after they beat the Israelites. The Israelites were not at peace. And so for the next thousand years, the Israelites were conquered by other empires like the Babylonians, the Assyrians, the Greeks, and then this big Roman or this big empire called Rome that sought to make peace another way. And when Jesus was born, he was born in this 200-year span called Pax Romana. Anyone ever hear of Pax Romana before? It means Roman peace. And what it really means is that it was a 200-year period of history in which Rome dominated the map, the world, the known world. From England to Morocco to Iraq was the Roman Empire. And if you lived in the Roman Empire, they imposed their way of life on everywhere. So that's Europe, Africa, and Asia. And everyone had to have Roman rules, Roman laws, Roman government, Roman roads, Roman aqueducts, Roman currency, Roman um, uh, trade systems. And so peace meant just be like us and we'll be at peace, right? So the world was at peace for 200 years because the Romans were in charge. Let me ask you this. During Pax Romana, do you think the Israelites felt that they were at peace? No. They were poor. They were enslaved. They were marginalized, they were crushed, they were not allowed to worship their God, they, were, they had taxes um, pushed upon them, they were exploited, they were forced to fight battles that were not their own. And so that piece of conformity and uniformity by oppression is actually not real peace. But I bring this up because I think that these are two ways that we also today seek to make peace, which is one of the reasons that disagreeing freely seems to be such an affront to who we are, because we believe that peace is about convincing your opponent of your view, right? If I have a way of thinking, the way to make peace is that you must think like me. And if I cannot beat you, right? If I cannot uh, bend your mind into uniformity or conformity, then I avoid you. Then I try and create larger strongholds and perhaps a larger army and fight the battle. But Jesus teaches us that God's way of peace is different than the world. In Luke 19, Jesus, it says, he even wept over Jerusalem and in, the, in this gospel, he says, as he came near and saw the city, he wept over it, saying, if you, even you, had only recognized on this day the things that make for peace. Jesus wept over Jerusalem because what, the people of Jerusalem, they wanted to fight, right? The zealots wanted a war, and the Pharisees, they just wanted to, to eat the scraps from the Romans' table. And Jesus knew that neither of those would lead to peace. Jesus knew that there's only one thing that leads to peace. And you know what that one thing is in God's reign? So when Jesus gives us the, the golden rule, he says, on this hang the law and the prophets. What he means is the whole covenant of God can be summarized in this thing. Do to others as you would have them do unto you. Later he summarizes this in another way. He says, love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, and strength. Love your neighbor as yourself. And Jesus says again, on this hang all the law and the prophets. Jesus teaches us that true peace only comes by living in the essence of the covenant that God gave to Moses on Mount Sinai. And at the heart of that covenant, we're not just 600 some laws, but the heart of that covenant was to be faithful to God and to faithful to our neighbor. And I find usually in the world, we, we, there are people who want to be faithful to God or people who want to be faithful to neighbor, right? There are people who stress religious piety and there are people who stress social justice. But holding these in tension are hard. And we actually don't like it, right? There are people who only want evangelism and people who only want social justice in the world. But Jesus says, God is not an either or, God is a both and. Right? Love God and love your neighbor. And the way you express love of God is to express love of your neighbor. Actually, that comes out in, um, in 1 John 4.20. It says, those who say, I love God and hate their brothers or sisters are liars. 
For those who do not love a brother or sister whom they have seen cannot love God whom they have not seen. I find that usually when I preach about love in the church, I almost inevitably get a phone call, a coffee date, or an email that says, it's so nice that you preach about love. And you know what word comes next? But. And there's a whole lot in the second half of that sentence. It's all the stuff, it's all the rule following I'm not preaching, right? It's all the punishment, it's all the condemnation. I'm not telling people that they're not wrong. I'm not laying it on thick, right? And here's what I want to say. Bell Hooks, who is a very profound Christian ethicist and um, uh, Christian education writer, she died this year, but I saw an interview recently that she gave, and she said, in a day and age where all, our all of our heroes are figures of conquest, think about that, most of our heroes are people who've won a battle, won a contest, they've conquered something, she says it's actually love that is heroic, think about that. Love is actually heroic. It's not wishy-washy. It's not nice. Love is risky. Love is dangerous. Love is not popular. Love is not easy. Love is seen as weak. But love is the only foundation for lasting peace. If you make peace through war, all you will get is war. But if you make peace through love, no one can take it from you. No storm, no wave, no politician, no angry person, and love can even transform anger and hatred itself. But what does this look like, really? How can we disagree in love? Now, I think that when one of the reasons I have not preached on the four practices of peacemaking is because I haven't been ready. <laughs> And I don't know that, that, that you all have been ready either, because I feel that people, when we talk about disagreeing freely, people ask me this question. How can we disagree freely when there is so much on the line? Maybe you feel that way. I feel that way. How am I expected to be okay if your opinion is so reckless and dangerous and, 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 and vitriolic? How are we to disagree freely when there are conflicts over how to keep our children safe? How are we supposed to disagree freely when we're trying to figure out how to root out violence in our world, how to keep the economy stable, how to prevent natural disasters and the devastating effects of climate change, how to lead our organizations, how to figure out who's allowed in and who's allowed out and who should be leading our world today? How do you expect me to disagree freely when these issues are so important and timely? Have you felt that way? Raise your hand if you have. Well, I think the answer is simple. Refuse to allow positions to turn the other person into your enemy. That's it. Refuse to allow positions to turn other people into your enemy. Work for justice. Do what is right. Seek righteousness, but don't need to be right. Don't treat people with contempt. Don't be quick to label people because they disagree or support something or someone you don't. Don't be nasty and feel that you are justified in doing so. Don't let who other people are change who you are. Jesus said, blessed are you when people persecute you in my name. Love your neighbor and love your enemy. Now, I want to just offer a couple practical things before I get out of this message, a, a couple practical steps of what I think that we can do in our society to disagree freely. I recently came across the writings of John Gottman. Does anyone know who John Gottman is? He's a, a family counselor. He's, he's actually the father or godfather of fa family therapy or family counseling theory. He's written a lot on marriage counseling. And he developed um, something he calls the four horsemen of the apocalypse. That's not dramatic, is it? Um, the wording comes from Revelation. But, but he calls them the four horsemen because they are four predictors of the end of a marriage. He says when he's working with couples, that if these four things are present, and if they can't get them under, under wraps, they predict the end of a relationship, the unraveling of the relationship. Are you ready for what these things are? One, criticism. 
Any, do you know, can, any examples of criticism? Why don't you put your turn signal on? Why did you make the left? You should go this way. Why did you set that down there? You knew I was going to put the pot right there. You never oh, emptied the dishwasher, right? You didn't take out the garbage. Third night in a row, I didn't... Anyone have... Am I triggering anyone? No? Okay. Criticism. Contempt. Contempt is when we assume the worst in someone's motivation. Well, I know you did that just because you're angry at me. I know you did that just to upset me, right? Contempt. The third thing, defensiveness. Defensiveness. I don't have to give you an example of defensiveness. And stonewalling, stonewalling is when we basically erect a wall, we, blo we block people out. We don't open up to them, we don't engage them. And the reason I'm sharing this with you is not so I can help your marriage, but because I think these are happening in our society today, right? Has anyone seen criticism in society in the last week? Has anyone seen contempt in society in the last week? Anyone seen defensiveness in society in the last week? Anyone seen stonewalling happen? Unfriending, defriending, avoiding, escaping, marginalizing. Now, the good news is that in our society, just like in our marriages, John Gottman said there are antidotes to the horsemen. You can turn these around, but it takes intentional efforts. And here are four things that you can do. One, a gentle start up right? The gentle startup is to find a positive interaction with the person in which you focus on I statements and you express a positive need. Think about the dishwasher. I talked about the dishwasher last, last week, and it has nothing to do with my own home, by the way. Okay. I statements with the dishwasher. I got home work. I got home from work late today. I'm really tired. I could really appreciate some help with the dishwasher. I, I'm expressing a positive need. In contrast to, I'm exhausted. You don't lift a finger around this house to help anyone. It's about darn time you unload the dishwasher all by yourself, right? Do you see the difference between those two things? Now look at how those might play out in society, right? If we're talking about gun violence, right? And into that is, you know, what I really want is for a world in which your kids and my kids can go to school and not have to do drills, and not worry about my, what might happen, right? It is a positive need, and it is a gentle start. The second is build a culture of appreciation. And that takes discipline, because sometimes we have to remind ourselves what we are grateful for in the other person. And maybe, maybe all we can muster in ourselves is, I'm so thankful that you smile a lot. Thank you for smiling and reminding me that today is good. Thank you for asking about my family. Thank you for always showing up and making the coffee in the office. Whatever it is, express gratitude and it can disarm defensiveness. The third antidote is take responsibility for yourself. Accept that their position is theirs. Jesus says, don't focus on the log in their eye. Focus on the log in your eye. So take responsibility for yourself. AA would call this, keep your side of the street clean. And then the fourth is physiological self-soothing. Sometimes you just need to take a break, right? Physiologic, that means take a walk. That means do something that keeps you mentally and physically healthy because in the midst of conflict and stonewalling, sometimes it is taxing and exhausts us. I believe that if we can find ways to create space to disagree freely and not vitriolically, we can leave the door open for God's love to change hearts and minds. The 19th century Lutheran theologian Rupertus Meldenius, I know all your favorite, everyone, you love this guy, right? He wrote this thing you probably have heard of, in essentials unity, in non-essentials liberty, but in all things charity. Only when we practice disagreeing freely can we truly live into this. So friends, hear me loud and clear. Work for what you believe. Don't accept hatred, injustice, or abuse. Seek to do God's work in the world. Make justice and make peace. Vote your conscience, advocate for what you believe, but simply allow the world 
to make other people your enemy because of their position. Disagree freely, and only then can we love regardless. That's next week. Amen. to provide us the practical tips to act on what Jesus taught us and uh, inviting us to make a peace in our daily lives. Yes, it is really hard to ask anything, create the space to ask anything or listen well and disagree freely and love regardless. However, the good news is we are not alone. God is with us, giving us the wisdom and courage and encouragement to for keep trying and keep doing to build the kingdom, God's kingdom here and now and we have each other. And I firmly believe one of the ways for us to uh, build our life on the rock, uh, the firm foundation is to be faithful in our everyday life from small things and our weekly offering and tithes and donations are the opportunity for us to be a part of God's kingdom building work as well as to make differences in and beyond our community. And so I am very grateful that we can do something together. And the, as love is not cheap and peace is not cheap, but we can do something together. And I, I will invite our ushers to pass the offering plate in a second. But you, there are many other ways for you to give. And you can give online at headonfieldemc.org slash give, or you can text the word give to the number on the screen. Yes. Okay. And so let us continue to worship through our generous giving as an expression of our faith and as a way of worship. <laughs> i 
now as we close today in our worship service, I invite you to stand, and we're going to sing People Need People. Let's stand together. Light, go, illumine, and heal the world. Be signs of God's reign in this world. May we seek to make God's peace. The good news is we don't do it alone. God gives us love, grace, and the spirit to guide us forward. As we leave this place, happy Father's Day to all the fathers and father figures, and may we be the church in a hurting world. Amen. <laughs>